ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਟੀਵੀ 84 ਦੇ ਸਾਰੇ ਦਰਸ਼ਕਾਂ ਦਾ ਮੈਂ ਅਮਰਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਕਰਦਾ ਵੀਅਰਸ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਵਾਸ਼ਿੰਗਟਨ ਡੀਸੀ ਸ਼ਹਿਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਯੂਐਸ ਕਾਂਗਰਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਹੁੰਚੇ ਹਾਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਅੱਜ ਸਾਊਥ ਏਸ਼ੀਆ ਦੀ ਧਰਤੀ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਹੋ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਹਿੰਸਾ ਹੋ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੀਦਾ ਕੀਦਾ ਰਿਲੀਜੀਅਸ ਲੀਡਰਸ ਦਾ ਕੀ ਰੋਲ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਹੋਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਚ ਐਕਟਰਸ ਰੋਲ ਪਲੇ ਕਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਰੋਕਿਆ ਜਾਵੇ ਇਸ ਸੰਬੰਧੀ ਯੂਐਸ ਕਾਂਗਰਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅੱਜ ਇੱਕ ਕਾਂਗਰੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਬ੍ਰੀਫਿੰਗ ਹੋਣ ਜਾ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਨੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੇ ਅੰਡਰ ਸੈਕਟਰੀ ਜਨਰਲ ਮਿਸਟਰ ਐਡਮਾ ਡੀਆਂਗ ਇੰਗਲੈਂਡ ਤੋਂ ਸਕਾਲਰ ਤੇ ਰਿਸਰਚ ਇੰਸਟੀਚਿਊਟ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਹੈੱਡ ਹੈਗੇ ਆ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਇਕਤਦਾਰ ਕਰਾਮਤ ਚੀਮਾ ਤੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇੱਕ 뮤ਜ਼ੀਅਮ ਹੈਗੀ ਆ ਹੋਲੋਕਾਸਟ 뮤ਜ਼ੀਅਮ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਇੱਕ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਇੱਥੇ ਅੱਜ ਹੀਰਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਹੁੰਚ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਟੈਸਟੀਫਾਈ ਕਰਨਾ ਸੋ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਪਹੁੰਚੇ ਆ ਇਸ ਇਵੈਂਟ ਨੂੰ ਕਵਰ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਦੇਖਣ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਕਿ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਸਾਊਥ ਏਸ਼ੀਆ ਦੀ ਧਰਤੀ ਦਾ ਹਿੱਸਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਉੱਥੇ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਹਿੰਸਕ ਘਟਨਾਵਾਂ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਠੱਲਣ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਪੱਧਰ ਤੇ ਕੀ ਅਪਰੋਚ ਲਈ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਅੱਜ ਇਸ ਬ੍ਰੀਫਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਕੀ ਦੇਖਣ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲਦਾ ਹੈ ਕੀ ਲਾਈਨ ਲਈ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਪੱਧਰ ਤੇ ਇਹਦੇ ਲਈ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਪਹੁੰਚੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਕੁਝ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਫਰੈਂਡਸ ਆਫ ਅਮਰੀਕਨ ਸਿੱਖ ਕਾਕਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਤੇ ਹੋਰ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਜਥੇਬੰਦੀਆਂ ਹੈਗੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਅਮਰੀਕਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਿੱਖ ਮਨੁੱਖੀ ਹੱਕਾਂ ਲਈ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਦੀਆਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦੇ ਵੀ ਅੱਜ ਇੱਥੇ ਪਹੁੰਚੇ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਚਰਚਾ ਕਰਦੇ ਆਂ ਇਸ ਇਸ਼ੂ ਦੇ ਉੱਪਰ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਜੀ ਮੇਰਾ ਨਾਮ ਸਤਨਾਮ ਸਿੰਘ ਹੈ ਮੈਂ ਸੈਲ ਡੈਫ ਤੋਂ ਬੋਲ ਰਿਹਾ ਹਾਂ ਸੈਲ ਡੈਫ ਦੀ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਆਊਟਰੀਚ ਦਾ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਆਊਟਰੀਚ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਦਾ ਮੈਨੇਜਰ ਹਾਂ ਜੀ ਮੈਂ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਕੈਪੀਟਲ ਹਿਲ ਚ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਹੋਏ ਹਾਂ ਸਿੱਖ ਕਾਕਸ ਦੇ ਜ਼ਰੀਏ ਸਿੱਖ ਕਾਕਸ ਇਹ ਇਵੈਂਟ ਆਰਗੇਨਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਤੇ ਇਵੈਂਟ ਹੈ ਜੀ ਇਹ ਰੋਲ ਆਫ ਰਿਲੀਜੀਅਸ ਲੀਡਰਸ ਐਂਡ ਐਕਟਰਸ ਇਨ ਪ੍ਰੀਵੈਂਟਿੰਗ ਇਨਸੀਡੈਂਟਸ ਆਫ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਤੇ ਜੀ ਇੱਕ ਸਿੱਖ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਤੇ ਇਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਬਣਦਾ ਕਿ ਕਿ ਸਾਡੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬਾਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਸਰਬੱਤ ਦਾ ਭਲਾ ਤੇ ਮਨੁੱਖਤਾ ਨੂੰ ਬਰਾਬਰਤਾ ਦਾ ਦੇਣ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਗੁਰੂਆਂ ਨੇ ਸੱਚ ਤੇ ਮਨੁੱਖਤਾ ਦੀ ਬਰਾਬਰਤਾ ਲਈ ਲੜਿਆ ਵੀ ਸਾਡਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਸਾਰਾ ਸਰਵੰਸ ਵਾਰਤਾ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸਿੱਖ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਤੇ ਮਨੁੱਖਤਾ ਦੀ ਭਲਾ ਲਈ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਅਗੇਂਸਟ ਅਦਰ ਐਵਰੀਬਾਡੀ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਅਗੇਂਸਟ ਅਗੇਂਸਟ ਮਾਈਨੋਰਟੀਸ ਐਂਡ ਐਂਡ and all sorts of minorities not just one particular minor- minority is it's important for us to be here because the foundation sikhandi ta namaindgi te sikhandi ta pehchani e hai ke sarbat da bhala mangde hai te sikh hon de naate te self def da represent hon de naate main ji itthe ajj capital hill ch aaya hoya ha te as e sikhan layi as e e briefing de vich ki ki manukhta de bhale bhale bare violence de bare violence nu rokne layi ki ki kita ja reha hai ude bare ਆ ਉਹ ਉਹ ਉਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਜਾਣਕਾਰੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਮਿਲੂਗੀ ਚੰਗਾ ਜੀ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਜੀ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਿੱਖ ਕੋਆਰਡੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਕਮੇਟੀ ਇਸ ਕੋਰਸ ਦੀ ਬਿਹਾਫ ਤੋਂ ਅੱਜ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕੰਗਰੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਹੀਰਿੰਗ ਹੋ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਅਗੇਂ ਸਟੇਟ ਕ੍ਰਾਈਮਸ ਤੇ ਰਿਲੀਜੀਅਸ ਹੇਟ ਸਪੀਚਸ ਬਾਰੇ ਉਹ ਚ ਪਾਰਟਿਸਪੇਟ ਕਰਨ ਆਏ ਆ ਸਾਡੀ ਐਕਸਪੈਕਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਸਾਊਥ ਏਸ਼ੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਰਟਿਕੂਲਰਲੀ ਇੰਡੀਆ
ਮੇਜਰ ਇਨਸੀਡੈਂਟ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਲੈਵਲ ਤੇ ਇਨਕੁਆਰੀ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾਵੇ ਤੇ ਇਹੋ ਜਿਹੀਆਂ ਸਰਕਾਰਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਚਾਰਟਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪਨਿਸ਼ਮੈਂਟ ਜਾਂ ਕੋਈ ਪੈਨਲਟੀਜ਼ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਦਿੱਤੀਆਂ ਜਾਣ ਇਹ ਸਾਡੀ ਐਕਸਪੈਕਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਹੈ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਸ ਹੈਰਿੰਗ ਹੁਣ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਹੋਣ ਵਾਲੀ ਹੈ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਅਸੀਂ ਦੇਖਾਂਗੇ ਕਿ ਉਸ ਹੈਰਿੰਗ ਦੀ ਕੀ ਡਿਸਕਸ਼ਨ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਸਾਡੇ ਨੇ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਸੋ ਬੀਇੰਗ ਦੈਟ ਟਾਈਮ ਇਜ਼ ਅ ਬਿਟ ਆਫ ਕੰਸਟ੍ਰੈਂਟ ਨਾ ਦੈਟ ਵੀ ਹੈਡ ਨਾ ਵਟ ਹੈਵਸ ਇਨ ਆਵਰ ਆਈ ਵਿਲ ਫਰੇਮ ਮਾਈ ਕਮੈਂਟਸ ਐਸ ਮੈਨੂ ਐਸ ਪੋਸੀਬਲ ਐਂਡ ਸੋ ਐਸ ਯੂ ਨੋ ਦ ਰੋਲ ਆਫ ਰਿਲੀਜੀਅਸ ਲੀਡਰਸ ਐਂਡ ਐਕਟਰਸ ਇਨ ਪ੍ਰੀਵੈਂਸ਼ਨ ਇਨਸਾਈਟਮੈਂਟ ਟੂ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ we are privy to sadness to all the current uh, actions that's going on around the world and we're saddened by that but uh, but we need to have an understanding um, where the leaders stand on either the prevention of such violences or incitement of such things or are they doing the positive sense in allowing us to repress when these things from happening so uh, I will get started to my right or to your left and we will have in the center um, the Honorable Adam Padama Dieng United Nations under Secretary General special advisor sir to the secretary and also general uh, on the prevention of genocide and to his right uh, Ms Naomi Kogler deputy director of Center for Prevention of Genocide at the United States Holocaust Museum Memorial Museum and to the right of the secretary is Dr Ekta Chima um Ekta Karma Chima director of Institute for Leadership and, uh, and Community Development. So again, I won't take much time. Uh, we will allow them to give their presentation so we have time for questions and answers if we have time after that. So again, the Honorable uh, Under uh, United Nations Under Secretary, uh, Dr. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, dear friends, uh, first of all, I'm so sorry that uh, we have to uh, start uh, that late this uh, event but I do understand there is uh, so much traffic and myself I did experience it. Uh, first of all allow me to start by thanking Congressman Jim Costa as well as uh, Ed Royce uh, for inviting me to speak uh, at this panel uh, and it is an honor definitely uh, for me to brief uh, all of you uh, for the second time in uh, six months. Uh, your interest, I would say, uh, in the mandate and the work of my office is a welcome sign uh, of uh, United States continuing commitment to preventing atrocity crimes as well as their incitement. And uh, I do uh, know that uh, the current uh, administration just uh, appointed uh, Mr. Hall to continue the work which the Atrocity Prevention Board uh, started, as you know, since 2012, which means that the prevention of uh, mass atrocities uh, remains uh, definitely uh, an issue of uh, uh, interest uh, for the current administration and that is why I cannot but really once again uh, thank uh, both Congressman uh, Ed Royce uh, as well as Jim Costa uh, for uh, bringing and facilitating <coughs> this meeting. Uh, I, I just returned from uh, Brussels where I uh, had briefed the European Parliament we had a discussion on the current situation uh, in Iraq following the Minewa, uh, the Sinjar, and I'm trying to address what to do uh, in terms of uh, bringing the perpetrators of the atrocity crimes, I mean genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes uh, committed uh, against the Yazidi Uh, community, but also against uh, all the uh, minorities in Iraq, uh, because I was a bit disappointed that until today there is not a single uh, perpetrator 
uh, who has been prosecuted, uh, indicted for the crime of genocide uh, against the Yazidis and also uh, the crimes, the other atrocity crimes committed against the other minorities. And if you may remember my first briefing uh, to Congress in December 2016, uh, focused on the mandate of my office, uh, the UN office on the uh, genocide prevention and responsibility to protect, uh, as well as steps uh, in the, uh, the United Nations is taking uh, to prevent genocide and other atrocity crimes around the world. You may certainly uh, note that today I was asked to speak specifically about the prevention uh, of incitement to violence, and in particular about the role of religious leaders and actors uh, in this regard. Uh, my remarks will thus have three main parts. Uh, I will first speak about incitement to violence, and how it relates to atrocity crimes. I will then speak about the prevention of incitement as a tool to prevent atrocity crimes. Finally, I will explore the role of religious leaders and actors in preventing incitement to violence. Although uh, fewer wars uh, are being waged today, uh, the number of conflict, death, has increased threefold uh, since 2008, uh, given the intensification of violence and the erosion of respect for principles of international humanitarian and human rights law. Uh, in many instances, uh, attacks against populations have been so serious uh, that we uh, believe they may constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, and even in some cases, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, referring to the uh, atrocity crimes committed by Daesh, we can definitely speak about also crime of genocide being committed. And uh, 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 we are, of course, seeing a worrying retreat uh, from a global commitment uh, to collective action to protect populations, and a cynical uh, assertion of the right to place national interests above moral, legal, and political commitment. Uh, we are also uh, seeing the widespread use of messages uh, in public discourse and the media uh, to incite hatred and hostility against individuals and communities based on their identity and, in the worst cases, uh, encouraging or inciting uh, violence. Uh, so, uh, dear friends, the term incitement to violence is included in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, which in Article 20, Alinea uh, 2, prohibits, and I quote, any advocacy of national racial or religious hatred uh, that constitute incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence, end of quote. Incitement to violence refers uh, to any communication that take various forms, including political speeches and flyers, media articles, uh, social media communications, and visual arts products uh, it can be subtle uh, or blatant. Advocacy of hatred uh, through any means nourish uh, bigotry, suspicion, and mistrust, uh, and have the power to divide societies and provoke violence. In recent years, it has contributed to violence in all regions of the world Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Much research has been done in recent years into the links between hate speech, incitement, and acts of violence, including by researchers working uh, with the U.S. Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum here in Washington, 
and uh, now me and uh, Kalia will speak more about that today and I'm really glad that now you found time out of your busy schedule to uh, accept this uh, invitation and join me uh, in this uh, journey. And we know uh, that for acts of uh, incitement uh, to result in violence, specific uh, elements need to be present, including a context that is conducive to violence, uh, an influential speaker, uh, in other words, a speaker whom people respect and respond to, a speech act that is widely disseminated, a receptive audience, and a target. And a target is usually individuals or groups with a specific ethnic, national, religious, political, sexual orientation, or gender identity for an act to constitute incitement to violence. There must be an intent on the part of the speaker to engage in advocacy for and cause violence. <laughs> there also need to be a certain degree of likelihood uh, that the act may result in the violence that it calls for. Like the act itself, the prevention of incitement to violence is rooted in international human rights standards, uh, including the 1948 uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the uh, Convention the, uh, on the Genocide uh, Prevention uh, Convention, the 1965 International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Rash, Racial Discrimination, the ICERD, and the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which I referred earlier, and in particular, it's Article 22, which I mentioned. The preventing incitement is also rooted in the responsibility to protect principle. Uh, as indicated in paragraph 138 and 139 of the 2005 World Summit uh, Outcome Document, uh, in which all heads of state and government uh, committed uh, to the responsibility to protect. Uh, state acknowledging uh, their responsibility and I go to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. But most important, they agreed also that this responsibility entails the prevention of such a crimes, including their incitement. Finding the means to diffuse, counter, and prevent incitement, humanize the audience so that hate speech and incitement have no impact and present alternative messages uh, can help to prevent violence uh, that can lead to atrocity crimes. Dear friends, Incitement to violence has become a common element of atrocities committed worldwide. It is both a trigger and an early warning sign of atrocities. In situations that have not yet escalated into violence, incitement to discrimination and hostility uh, contributes uh, to sowing the seeds of suspicion, mistrust, and intolerance, and building tensions between communities uh, that can be hard uh, to diffuse. And as the framework of analysis uh, for atrocity crimes uh, developed by my office underlines, increased inflammatory rhetoric uh, propaganda campaigns or hate speech uh, targeting particular communities or individuals based on their identity uh, contribute to enabling 
or preparing atrocity crimes, and they are indicators uh, that those crimes are likely to be committed. In this context, uh, reacting to the presence of hate speech uh, and incitement in societies divided along identity lines and in situations where tensions are high uh, can contribute to early warning and prevention efforts. In our efforts to prevent and counter incitement, it is important to consider which actors are most influential. Of course, the state has the primary responsibility to prevent incitement to violence, and political leaders have a great influence over populations. They thus uh, have a particular responsibility uh, to condemn any discourse that could constitute incitement to violence and all hate crimes. However, the state is not the only actor with influence. Religious leaders can have a strong influence over the behavior of those who follow their faith and share their belief in many parts of the world. When they speak out, their followers listen. Religious leaders can use their influence in either positive or negative ways. We have seen that uh, some uh, have used their position uh, to spread hateful messages uh, that have incited violence. Many others, however, uh, have been responsible for preventing and countering violence and its incitement by spreading messages of peace, tolerance, acceptance, and respect. For this reason, I decided to work more closely with these eminent actors and over the last two years uh, have engaged with religious leaders across the world in a process that we refer to as the first process. And I'm glad that uh, my friend and brother Mohammed Sanusi is around. Uh, who is one of the uh, members of the advisory body which I put in place uh, with eminent scholars uh, to uh, help in uh, really uh, mobilizing uh, religious leaders around the world. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, the name FES is simply because the first global meeting took place in Fez two years ago where we brought uh, all good faith. I mean, name them Jews, Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, etc. Uh, Baha'i, uh, simply because we felt that it was important uh, by organizing the series of meetings uh, between April 2015 uh, till December 2016 in collaboration with a wide range of partners and those who contributed to these consultations, uh, including uh, religious leaders, faith-based organizations, and secular organizations as well, uh, and in, as well as government officials, uh, regional organizations, UN agencies, and subject matter experts. And I think it is extremely important. I was just uh, last uh, weekend with the former president of Senegal, Abdou Diouf, who then was the head of the Francophone. And he was saying to me uh, when he asked me, so how are you, Adana? And I said, well, I'm well in a crazy world. And then he said, well, I think the problem is we need more faith and hope in this world. And he said it is important that we have leaders who have faith and who have also hope. And I think that, that is very important. And what we are doing 
this journey we have started all together in, in, in faith is, is in fact aimed uh, to uh, revigorate this importance of faith and, and, and hope, la foi et l'espérance. Uh, and uh, I should say that uh, several organizations have supported us through the process, uh, including the uh, KAISI, which is the King Abdullah uh, International uh, Center for Dialogue, uh, as well as the World Council of Churches, the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers, uh, and the consultation was hosted by the government of Ethiopia for the African region, Morocco, Italy, Jordan, Thailand, and the United States. Uh, so the first consultation took place in Fez, as I say, uh, with the support of Casey and the government of Morocco, and included uh, senior religious leaders. And uh, I think what is extremely important is that uh, we have very constructive discussions uh, uh, not only in phase, but throughout the regional forum we organize it. And uh, a draft plan of action uh, has been uh, prepared, and uh, the regional, of course, uh, consultation serving to develop context-specific regional strategies uh, for religious leaders and actors uh, to prevent incitement to violence also, and serve it to refine the uh, first plan of action. And in all, uh, a total of 232 uh, religious leaders and actors from 77 countries, including the United States, uh, took part in the consultations. And participants included, like I said, uh, Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, uh, Sikh, Jews, Hindus, from different groups and denominations, as well as representatives from various religious minorities, including Baha'i, uh, Kakai, Yazidi, uh, and Candomblé, as well as humanists. Because at the end of the day, what we have to uh, be uh, simply uh, aware is that we are one world and we are one humanity. So whatever our we believe our religion. And when it comes to the religion of Islam, I can say that uh, I always quote this very important uh, uh, word of uh, the Almighty God, Allah, when he said, no constraint in religion. And that's to me very important. And you will also remember that when the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fled Mecca, when his companion also fled, went to, those who went to Abyssinia, which is the today Ethiopia, the emperor of Abyssinia, who was a Christian, welcomed them. And when the Mecca people came, he refused to hand it off to these people. And instead, he asked them that they be provided with land, he give them tools. Why? Because he said these people believe in the same God, I believe, the God of Abraham. And when Muhammad went to Yatri, which is today in Madina, in Saudi Arabia today, there were rabbi Jews who were in that uh, city of Yatri. They didn't uh, reject him. They also welcomed him, offered him. So, so simply, uh, therefore, it was no surprise. I mean, if the Almighty God wanted, we will be only one, there will be only one religion, there will be only one color, there will be only one language. And I keep saying that our Creator loves diversity. And therefore, we cannot say that we are believers and not managing diversity in the most constructive manner. We have to respect diversity, we have to respect the other. And that's why I hope one of these days I will complete a writing I have started, which I call uh, the clashes of ignorance. Because I said the most greatest risk 
we are facing is not the clashes of civilization, but that is the clashes of ignorances. We have to start knowing each other better, respecting each other, respecting our differences. And uh, we, therefore, have to stand and protect those minorities. And that is why, uh, when I was in Iraq, I very much insisted on the need to empower those minorities and across the globe. And uh, if you go to <coughs> India today, it is important that one embrace also the diversity. Make sure that the diversity in India be managed in the most constructive manner. And uh, I was in Benares uh, where I met uh, spiritual leaders and I simply hope that we will be able to continue also uh, spreading this message of uh, peace and hope in that uh, great country, uh, the country of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, so, uh, simply uh, one last word. That is also the place and the role of women. Uh, and uh, that's one of the uh, important uh, dimensions we made clear that in this process we have to ensure that the women also made their contribution. And as a result, at least 30% of the participants in all the meetings we organized around this uh, team were women. And it was a challenge. It was definitely a challenge to identify the right people to bring to the table. We wanted to include participants with a whole range of views, uh, not only those who agreed with us. I mean, uh, it was important that you discuss also uh, with people you disagree with. Uh, and we were not searching, I should say, for a comfortable discussion, uh, but one that would be both challenging and productive. Uh, and I believe we succeeded, uh, and I certainly came out richer uh, from these uh, consultations, and I'm very grateful to those who accompanied me and some of them are in this room today, Mohamed, uh, Chima, and uh, Simona. So the outcome of the phase process is a consolidated uh, plan of action for religious leaders and actors uh, to prevent and counter incitement to violence that could lead to atrocity crimes. And the recommendations in the plan of action uh, are relevant both from an early warning perspective and when crises are imminent. And there are three sets of recommendations. The first focuses on prevention. And I'm glad that the new uh, United Nations Secretary General has uh, made prevention at the highest place during his tenure. He wants to focus on prevention and linking prevention and development. Because you cannot speak about development without taking seriously the preventative dimension to prevent conflict, to prevent atrocity crimes, etc. And then the uh, second uh, also uh, recommendation focuses on strengthening societal resilience by enhancing education and capacity building. Education, as Mandela used to say, is the key uh, to solve the problems of our planet. Strengthening collaboration with traditional and new media. Uh, because I think it is very important, because we see today the importance of the new media. Uh, as I said, I belong to a generation, the old generation, which is not very much uh, familiar with the social media, uh, has the importance uh, there of also working with the young people. I think the future belongs to the youth. And, uh, and we need today, more than ever, empower the young people, empower the women. If we succeed, we can definitely uh, see that the world 
will have a new face, a face of generosity, a face of solidarity, uh, a face without prejudice. But we have to work hard. We have to make sure that the young people are not drive into uh, the wrong direction. Uh, and then we have also uh, to uh, strengthen uh, engagement with regional and international partners uh, and fostering interfaith and intrafaith dialogue. Uh, and in this uh, regard, uh, I, I should say that uh, I'm extremely pleased with the uh, efforts of a great scholar and spiritual leader uh, whose name is, uh, is Sher uh, Bin Baya. Uh, Sher Bin Baya is uh, doing such uh, important work uh, that we need to really make every effort uh, to uh, take uh, and endorse what he is doing. I mean, uh, without, I would say, uh, any form of a rest, he is day and night bringing people together, people of various uh, faith, and, and trying uh, to really make our world a better place, uh, trying to promote uh, a peaceful, inclusive, and just societies. And how through respecting and protecting and promoting human rights and establishing uh, networks of religious leaders and action is the respect and promotion of international human rights standards, uh, in particular the right to freedom of expression and opinion, freedom of religion and belief, and the right to peaceful association. So, distinguished uh, guests, the Plan of Action is a pioneering document as it is the first to engage faith leaders to develop context-specific strategies to prevent incitement that could lead uh, to atrocity crimes and it will be officially launched uh, at a meeting chaired by Secretary General uh, Guterres on July 14th in New York, and it will be followed by meetings with member states and a range of organizations interested in supporting its implementation. And I strongly believe uh, that the implementation of the plan of action uh, can contribute to the prevention of atrocity crimes, uh, especially in areas uh, affected by religious and sectarian tensions and violence. However, it is far more likely to succeed if it has political support. In this context, I hope uh, that the United States, uh, as a champion of peace and security worldwide, uh, as well as freedom of religion and belief, will support the implementation of the Plan of Action, both in the United States and in other parts of the world. And I will end on that note, uh, looking forward to hearing your views and to discussing how we can work together uh, to prevent incitement and the violence it encourages. I thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It's just amazing that this briefing is in time for as we move forward to something of that nature. And we're so honored to have the United Nations working on these things. And sometimes we don't get the right positive uh, note that the United Nations is working so hard to bring these, all these international, and but also uh, bodies such as the United States and the members of Congress, and especially the staff present here, will take that message back to them. And of course, it's hard to follow the Under Secretary General, which is why we had a toss going in. Mr. Iftatima lost it, so having to follow uh, uh, Under Secretary. Uh, the PowerPoint will be displayed, unfortunately both screens aren't working, so if you could be kind enough to follow Mr. Chima's uh, PowerPoint uh, on the screens about. Thank you. Mr. Tiang, uh, Under Secretary General of the United Nations, 
uh, Naomi, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for your presence. I try to keep you awake because it's a late afternoon. Um, so I think you have to focus on the uh, projector there because I got a few slides which have some statistical data uh, which I will be elaborating. So my presentation now will first explain about the hate speech and hate crime. Um, what, what is hate speech and what is hate crime. But I will be using three case studies of the three countries, which is uh, Pakistan, India, and um, Myanmar, and analyzing, um, as Mr. Dian has rightly said, that the faith leaders can play a very important role uh, to stop the incitement to violence. Um, but sometimes we see that the hate speech and uh, the hate crimes actually emerges from the from the speech by the faith leaders and the messages they sent to the member of the public. Um, so we start first with, with the first slide, which is about defining uh, the hate speech. Although hate speech is a, is a very um, gray area where very people has defined hate speech in a different ways and there are very thin lines how you define the hate speech. But uh, looking at various um, endemic uh, definitions, I think the best would be that hate speech is defined as bias motivated, hostile, malicious speech aimed at a person or a group of people because of some of their actual or perceived innate characteristics. And you can also say that it, is, it expresses discriminatory, intimidating, disproving, agnostic, and prejudicial attitudes toward those characteristics which include sex, race, religion, ethnicity, color, national origin, disability, or sexual orientation. And I think Mr. Dian, um, you know, very appropriately and much in detail, has covered those areas uh, while breaking in the briefing today. Now, we go to the next one uh, because usually uh, people don't distinguish uh, between the hate speech and the hate crime. Um, hate speech, I think, it is the initial phase, and that may lead to the hate crime. It, it, it could be a hate crime in verbal, or it could be a uh, violent hate crime. So, how we define the hate crime? Hate crime is any criminal offense which is perceived by the victim or any other person to be motivated by hostility or prejudice um, based on person's actual or perceived race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Um, so that's the definition I'm taking to the uh, rest of my slides. Uh, we now going to go to uh, the three case studies of the three countries, Pakistan, India, and Myanmar to identify uh, that how um, the hate speech um, is uh, turning into uh, hate crime and the, the violence in the region. So we first go to Pakistan, and, and the major issue with, with Pakistan at the moment is the blasphemy lynching, where a lot of uh, hate speech uh, is coming from the faith leaders about the blasphemy. The country has uh, the uh, blasphemy laws, and there, there is a legal framework about the blasphemy, which obviously denies the religious freedom in the country. But more than that, in the way the religious leaders talk about the blasphemy um, and about people, it often um, end up with, with some sort of, with a very violent hate crime um, or incitement to violence, where uh, some of the major figures have lost their life, including Punjab's governor Salman Tasir. We recently have seen a student in Indian Pakistan University, Mishal Khan, um, who was violently murdered uh, because due to the rhetoric, due to the hate speech coming from the, from the religious leaders and the society. Uh, so blasphemy lynching, I think, is one of the major issues um, which is inciting um, hatred as well as it is leading to uh, the violent um, incitement in the country. Then we have anti anti hatred and violence in Pakistan where uh, the MD community was uh, long ago, um, in 1973, were declared non-Muslims, and that is obviously a very uh, big constitutional discrimination against the MD uh, community. But uh, it, it doesn't finish there. Uh, the, the faith leaders in Pakistan and the religious leaders have been inciting uh, hatred and violence against the MD community, and there has been recent killings in Pakistan of the, uh, the faith leaders of the MD community. Uh, four or five people have recently lost their life, and uh, there was a state-backed um, attack on the MDA publication centers uh, where all the, uh, their materials were confiscated. Um, then, obviously, when we look at the books uh, published in Pakistan, the textbooks, it contains a lot of uh, material which may lead to, uh, to atrocity, um, 
against the minorities, as well as toward other faiths. And, it, it, and you know, I think the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom has published um, a very comprehensive report uh, last year about uh, the uh, about the issue, and they have cited various texts which are present in the textbooks in Pakistan, uh, which uh, leads to the violence as well as incitement against the other religious communities. And few of the texts suggest that um, there are other the other faiths in the country are probably inferior uh, than the faith of Islam, and there are derogatory remarks about Hinduism, uh, its history as well as um, a, a comparison between Islam and Christianity. And, uh, and it indoctrinates the population and, and the young brains where um, Islam is shown as a superior uh, ideology and the rest of the faiths are shown as very inferior um, you know, sort of ideology. Uh, that leads to violence uh, on most of the game. But uh, use, after the use of recommendations, I think uh, uh, some texts were removed, but most of the texts are still present in uh, the Islamic studies and the Pakistani studies books um, in Pakistan. Uh, and I think they need to focus on this because it often leads to incitement to violence. Then recently, we, uh, I mean, th th there is an ongoing issue specifically in the province of Sindh, where the faith leaders will use rhetoric against the Hindu community um, in uh, the province of Sindh, uh, where the uh, Hindu females specifically have been abducted or kidnapped um, under the influence of the religious leaders. And those Hindu women were then uh, forcefully mar uh, got married to the Muslim men and they were forcefully converted to Islam. Um, this is obviously an ongoing concern where religious leaders would encourage uh, this to happen. Um, and uh, I was very upset about the, uh, the reports recently that in the country's uh, largest city, which is Karachi, um, and it, it housed a very big Hindu community uh, in Karachi. Uh, the people, uh, specifically the faith leaders, are using a narrative uh, to, uh, to abduct people from their houses and to take the ownership of their land. Um, so this is very, very recent. Most importantly, Pakistan uh, faith leaders um, has a long history of sectarian violence, where uh, the sects will speak against each other we have seen uh, Shia versus Sunni and Sunni versus Shia narrative, which had led to a lot of violence in the country. Um, the country has a wider issue of terrorism, but um, a lot of it comes through the, uh, the, the violence coming uh, from the faith leaders and the incitement to the faith leaders in Pakistan uh, due to their sectarian divide us. Um, in few other slides, I will show you that what is the level of sectarian violence in Pakistan. So if we go to the next slide, please. So if you look at this data, by the way, this data has been taken from the South Asian Tourism Portal. From 2003 to 2017, very recent, because I've just picked up this data um, this week, so it is very recent, uh, we see that um, total number of uh, fatalities so far is 62,105 uh, in Pakistan. And I'm not going to go year by year. Uh, it is very clear in the slides that um, how, uh, how many people have lost their life in the violence in the country. But when you look at the sectarian violence, which is always religious motivated or related to the, the speeches um, or, or the violent rhetoric coming from the, from the faith leaders of Shia or Sunni, um, Sunni sects, um, this is what is recorded. There will be more casualties than this which, which have not been recorded. It is about 10,533 people have lost their life you know, due to the sectarian violence. And it didn't spare in the country even the, the mosques, which are the religious places of the Muslims, places of worship. Um, and uh, if you look at the statistical data, there are 2,748 uh, 2, attacks on the mosques. And these are uh, attacks motivated by the sectarian violence. Um, so it, it clearly exhibits the, the state of uh, hate speech um, and specifically uh, the, the sectarian violence coming from the country. Um, next slide, please. So I have done some analysis here uh, based on the, uh, the statistics that obviously I mean, the country has a wide ratio of uh, the uh, violent extremism, but um, there was a recent survey to elaborate uh, which are the major factors in violent extremism in the country. Um, and um, the figures shows that the l local religious actors and uh, the sectarianism are at the top when it comes to Pakistan um, and uh, the, the violent extremism. These are two one major factors. Uh, they are uh, two the highest ones, the 
uh, uh, religious actor in the way they behave, in the way they conduct themselves, and uh, then uh, we, we have issues about the religious schools or the Muslim seminaries. They are um, at number three um, in the factors, and obviously there are other factors, but obviously they are not the focus of discussion today, so I'm not going to go to the other factors. Uh, but the fact remains that the local religious actors, the sectarianism, and the Muslim seminaries in the country um, are spreading a lot of um, hate speech, which is leading to, uh, to violence. So then we move to India. Uh, India, uh, again, we, we have uh, a couple of issues of uh, the, the rhetoric and the hate speech, um, which may lead to violence in the days to come. Um, Recently, we have demands from the Hindu Tava forces to declare India a Hindu country. Um, I mean, any country can change its constitution and it, it is open uh, to changes. But uh, the sort of Hindu state they want to create is very much based on the uh, ideology of Hindu Tava. And I've explained um, in, in the slides there that uh, what Hindu Tava is because I've uh, taken uh, uh, a little script from uh, Swarkar's uh, who is the founder of the ideology of Hindu Dharma in India. Uh, he defines Hindu, anyone who, who is born uh, in India should be considered as Hindu. So we have this rhetoric uh, recently coming from India which says Hindu, Hindi and Hindustan, uh, that this country um, is for the Hindus and the language should be Hindi. And um, everyone who, who is here uh, following the ideology of Hindu Dharma uh, simply means that the faiths who were born in India i.e. Sikhism, Jainism and Buddhism um, are part of Hinduism and hence they should be submerged into Hinduism and the, and the faiths which um, don't have bases um, in India as fatherland i.e. Christianity, Judaism and Islam either they should leave India or they should convert to Hinduism because they are not taking hin um, Hinduism as a faith but as a civilization or as a nation. Uh, which is a very, very counterproductive narrative, and that may lead to atrocity crimes in the country. Um, and the, the same issue is with the Constitution, uh, Article 25 uh, to uh, B, which still narrates uh, the Sikhs, the Buddhists, and the Jains um, as Hindus. And there are uh, the, the, uh, the family laws, we, we narrate them as such, uh, and uh, these minority communities uh, for years have been struggling that they should be given their religious identity in the world through the constitutional means. Then we have issues of the core protections and the beef lynching. Um, again, um, it, it is a, rhet a rhetoric coming from the faith leaders um, because cow is a, uh, is a sacred animal um, in, in their faith, um, but um, other faiths are not allowed to consume uh, the meat. Um, and we have uh, seen that there is a huge set of legislation in India present today to persecute people on the uh, basis of uh, cow meat consumption. And there are now cow ministries established in India for the welfare of the cows. Laws are one thing, but on the other hand, in the way the faith leaders are portraying it to the members of the public uh, in the state, it is um, ending to violent, uh, violent activities. If people rightly remember, uh, there have been few killings of the Muslims in India uh, simply on the, uh, on the acquisitions that they consume the beef. Uh, Muhammad Ikhlaq, a Muslim, uh, was last year killed uh, on consuming the beef. And um, following that, uh, his family is facing a lot, of, um, a lot of trouble at the moment from the local Hindu Dalla forces who on a daily basis go and harass them. Uh, and the, the people who killed uh, Muhammad Ikhlaq, they have not been persecuted uh, till now. Attack on, uh, we know about the Garbapsi scheme, uh, the convergence scheme which was started in 2014. It was stopped uh, for a while, but um, it is coming uh, into limelight again uh, with the media news only um, uh, two weeks or ten days ago that uh, again uh, with, with the election of the U new UP chief minister and with the rhetoric coming, uh, there are Muslims, about uh, 12 Muslims who have recently been converted uh, forcefully to Hinduism. So Gharwapsi um, is coming back to limelight. There are attacks on the churches. Um, there, there is a huge statistical data issued on this. We, we suggest uh, the number of attacks on the churches. But one of the major concerns for, for the Christian organizations at the moment is that 
uh, under the, uh, the legislation about the charities, there are various uh, Christian charities who have been banned in India. Um, there were 9,000 plus charities previously banned in India, including the Greenpeace and a couple of other Christian uh, organizations who were working about the minority or religious rights of, of the Christians in India. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned that uh, through Article 25 to B, the, the Sikhism, Buddhism and Jainism um, are submerged um, constitutionally um, in, in Hinduism, uh, but there are increased attacks uh, against these identities and we have seen recently a lot of cases of the desperation of the uh, Guru Granth Sahib, uh, the Holy Sikh scripture, and um, there were attacks that we have seen in Indore, a Sikh temple has been demolished. And the, the, uh, the Sikh temple, uh, in, which is called Gyan Godri, uh, where uh, the Sikh, uh, the founder of the Sikh uh, faith religion, Guru Nanak went, uh, it was very, very historic. That has been demolished previously and currently uh, the rhetoric coming from the uh, from the faith leaders there does not allow Sikhs to, to visit uh, that very place, which is a, a major concern at the moment for that very community. Caste system and in the way um, the, the faith leaders from uh, from uh, from RSS, from uh, Bajran Dal um, and others uh, portrayed it is uh, leading to further persecution of Dalits because uh, there are millions of Dalits in India today which are still considered to be untouchable. Uh, so it is uh, not only leading to the violent extremism, but um, uh, untouchability has long uh, been abolished by the Indian constitution, uh, but in practice, due to the caste system, uh, it is still there against the Dalit community uh, present today. Uh, so these are some of the, the major concerns about India. Now we move to the next country, which is Myanmar. Next is Myanmar. As you can see in the pictures there, that um, a Buddhist monk has written on his hand, uh, Rohingyas, no. And there have been uh, quite a demonstration that those who support Rohingyas are, are enemies. And you, know, you can see in the pictures that how Rohingyas are being treated. Recently there, is a, there has been a rise of Buddhist 969 movement um, and Association of Protection of Race and Religion, uh, Mabatha. So uh, this 969 movement, um, they say that it is a, um, it is a movement to, to counter the Muslims and the Rohingyas, and they said because Muslims have this uh, number 786, which means, uh, as you would be aware, that few of the Muslims use that as with the name of God. So they have started a counter organization, which is called 969, and they, uh, the, the, the monks uh, have a lot of violent attacks on, on the Muslim community and a lot of violent um, violent extremism is found in the country. The, the pictures over there would show not uh, to you not the political leaders, but you can see that they are all religious figures. They are all Buddhist monks who, who are advocating and preaching against the Rohingya community. They have been denied citizenship um, for years, the Rohingyas, and I think one of the, the largest stateless community on planet Earth today are Rohingyas because they, are, they have always been denied the, uh, the citizenships and they have been uh, displaced um, forcefully, they have been put into labor um, by, by the locals, and there have been restrictions on their marriages and the birth control. Um, I met few uh, Rohingyas who, would, uh, uh, who, who have told me that their persecution is of that level, that if they, uh, a Rohingya has to spend uh, a night to their relative's house, they first have to go to a police station to get this uh, recorded, that uh, to get this recorded that uh, they are uh, staying overnight to their mother or their uncle or their uh, sister's house. Uh, if people have to get the telephone sings, they have to get it through drop lots and all the calls are recorded. Um, and likewise, there are arbitrary uh, detentions and there is a restriction on the freedom of movement. So this is the situation in three of the South Asian countries. There are obviously various other countries, but I use these um, examples to illustrate that um, the faith leaders can play a very positive role in these situations and they can obviously influence uh, the perception of the public and they should stand uh, for the minority rights uh, to protect those rather to lead it to violent extremism or, uh, or rather using the narratives which will lead um, to the persecution of minorities in these countries. 
Um, and I think that make your work very, very relevant and uh, had the honor to, to be with the faith leaders being the member of uh, your advisory committee. And I think we uh, need to strengthen these ties with our faith leaders and need to give them more training that these are the situations where they need to chip in and help uh, the people uh, who are disadvantaged and who have been marginalized in these countries. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Chief. Thank you, Dr. Chief. And next, Ms. Naomi Kikola, uh, Deputy uh, Director. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Naomi Kikola, and I'm with the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And we're here to talk about the phenomenon of what we call dangerous speech and the concerns that we have about it. But in particular, to talk as well about a guide that we created that is a resource for communities, uh, not just religious leaders, but for individuals to be able to counter speech that is considered to be dangerous. Um, perhaps as a bit of an overview, our center undertakes research, policy, uh, outreach, and work on justice issues related to the risk of genocide and crimes against humanity and tries to alert the national conscience here in the United States, but also internationally, as part of the mandate of the museum. As many of you know, genocide and crimes against humanity are preventable crimes. And there are early warning signs, apparent months and often years before the unfolding crimes occur. All too often, the world acts too little and too late in response to those signs. History has shown that a common, though not necessary, feature of many atrocity crimes is that they are preceded by dangerous speech, including incendiary hate speech. The Holocaust, Rwanda, and today with ISIS, and also the treatment of the Rohingya in Burma, are glaring examples of that phenomenon. Our concern, in part, is twofold. One is that we should regard dangerous speech and hate speech and incitement as a early warning sign identifying communities that have got increased vulnerability. But second, we should also be looking at dangerous speech and incendiary speech as an actual tool that's used to orchestrate violence and carry out the violence. This guide that we established was in response to the phenomenon that we have seen that has spanned over 70 years in regards to uh, atrocities that occurred after the Holocaust. And it's essentially a tool which we regard called diffusing hate. It's a strategic communications guide to counter dangerous speech. Dangerous speech is speech that increases the risk for violence targeting certain people because of their membership in a group such as ethnic, religious, or racial group. It includes both speech that qualifies as incitement, and I think Adama went into um, detail in terms of explaining the, the legal foundations of that, of that term, and speech also that makes incitement possible by conditioning its audience to accept, condone, and commit violence against people who belong to a targeted group. So our focus is slightly broader in terms of the type of speech that we are concerned about. One example that we point to involves Hutu extremists who are able to incite genocide in Rwanda in part because of years of propaganda that have been used to influence how Hutus regarded uh, their, their fellow neighbors, Tutsis, as less than human. And that the perceived narrative of them being dangerous, being foreigners, uh, culminated a moment and a point in which the extremists could essentially flip a switch and with that uh, see the, the genocide unfold. Propagandist tool may not have perhaps been genocide, but their work prepared Hutus to understand and answer the call to act when extremist leaders launched the genocide. Dangerous speech can take many forms. It can be an actual speech. It can be a pamphlet. It can be an online post, a video, an image, or a message on a t-shirt, or even a song. Its message may call for violence against a targeted group, or it may portray that targeted group in a way that makes violence against them seem reasonable justified or necessary. Dangerous speech often seeks to dehumanize the group, calling its members specific names, and you know many, rats, dogs, lice, cockroaches. It accuses the target group of planning to harm another community and presents the target group's existence as a dire threat to that particular community. 
Speech can even be dangerous if it isn't intended to cause violence. For example, a false rumor that a rival group is planning to attack could make violence against the group's members seem like justified self-defense. We've seen many examples where such rumors have led to, unfortunately, scores of individuals, hundreds of individuals being killed in a relatively short period of time. As, as Adama mentioned, the speech by itself does not necessarily make that speech dangerous. And part of the research that went into the guidebook that we have and that you can access on our website was focused on trying to better understand what is it about the nature of different forms of speech that makes them so particularly dangerous, that can make them incendiary? What are the environments that are more conducive, unfortunately, to seeing the, the commission of violence? And as Adama noted, the findings of that work included that factors that give speech the power to provoke violence include, one, a speaker who is influential or popular with the audience, Two, the medium or the means used to communicate a message that makes the audience more likely to access, believe, or spread the speech. Three, a context that increases the risk that the speech will provoke violence towards a group. And four, an audience that is receptive to that speech that promotes violence, fear, or hatred towards a group. There are a number of measures that can be taken to prevent dangerous speech from conditioning and inciting audiences to commit group-targeted harm and that can enhance efforts to prevent genocide, mass atrocities, and other forms of collective violence that target victims based on their group identity. A few considerations just before we go into what some of the tools are, including this particular handbook, is that one of the powers and one of the trends that we have seen with the use of hate speech is that those who tend to use dangerous uh, speech, hate speech, take stereotypes and play on those particular stereotypes or try to do something which is essentially called collapsing the dimensions of comparison. So one example of that could be in regards to the collapsing the dimension of comparisons. Theory has got a mind of its own, and for some reason comes alive at certain points. So I apologize for that. <laughs> it's actually scary, but it might very well be. Um, in Rwanda, and I did my graduate research on the, the use of hate speech in Rwanda, um, what you essentially saw happen was a couple of factors. You had a state-supported uh, state radio station, and it was very interesting because in that particular case, uh, radios were widely available in Rwanda because they had been disseminated and shared widely to help promote agriculture to help share best practices with people throughout the country. And for a society that at that time was had a very high rate of illiteracy, the radio enabled the propagandists to essentially have a greater access within the particular country. Um, it was something that was very cheap for them to be able to, to use. And what they essentially did was they took the the time frame of the 1991, 1992, 1993, and it, they collapsed it and they would talk about life and what life was like when the Tutsi minority were in a pre-independence um, Rwanda in control. And so they would talk about uh, oppression and persecution that had happened during that time period as though it was a very, very recent proximate event. So they would collapse those time periods to try to help to instill uh, hate and to dehumanize the population. We've seen as well, uh, in the context of the Holocaust, the use of a number of stereotypes, the use of propaganda material, including uh, the dissemination of the Zion elders. You've got, in the case of the Yazidi, uh, and Christians and others in northern Iraq who've been persecuted, the use by the Islamic State, uh, self-proclaimed Islamic State and others, of references to the Yazidi as being devil, devil worshippers, Christians as being crusaders, Shias being infidels, the tendency to try to dehumanize them and strip them of their identity. Um, I think in the interest of time, because we are running out of time, I'll just highlight a few other quick things. Uh, I mentioned that those who seek to use these types of, uh, this type of speech are often very innovative in the tools that they use 
and in their means for disseminating messages of hate. We've seen that most recently through the use of social media. Uh, their ability to innovate and to spread messages of hate often outpaces our ability to respond and counter them, which is particularly worrying. It's also important to just highlight that though in the Holocaust, we look at the use of propaganda and the use of propaganda over almost a decade to dehumanize and desensitize the, the uh, local populations in regards to how they viewed their neighbors and how they viewed, viewed Jews. In the cases, in other cases like the Islamic State and even the Rwanda context, um, we've seen that hate speech in a very, very short period of time, dangerous speech in a very short period of time, can have that similar effect. Um, I believe there's already been quite a lot of discussion about the important role that religious leaders can play. So perhaps just to quickly summarize a couple of the responses, we believe that it's incredibly important for policymakers to focus on monitoring uh, for an early warning purpose the use of dangerous speech and hate speech. This includes funding local organizations, um, ensuring that the State Department has the ability to uh, support local civil society who can do the monitoring on the ground. It also would involve ensuring that U.S. officials on the ground at embassies and also here in Washington are doing their own monitoring, are engaging with local communities to ensure that reports and worrying signs are reported back so that we can ensure that policies are crafted here with an atrocity prevention uh, lens to them and that there are programmatic responses taken on the ground. Uh, of course, one of the concerns with the, the potential community budget is that exactly those parts of the State Department that would be responsible for doing the early warning uh, and the monitoring and the support of civil society may very well be those facing cuts. There are numerous tools that are available for countering hate speech. This is one such tool that enables local communities to develop their own strategies for countering uh, hate speech and for creating messages that are more constructive or uh, tackle. One example, it's a small example, in the last Kenyan election, uh, there was a, a messages that went out on Twitter suggesting that a church in Mombasa had been burnt and that there had been um, an attack on it very quickly. Others in the local community were able to send out by Twitter images showing that that was not actually the case. So finding strategies to very quickly counter and provide an alternative narrative is important. Laws can be enacted, but we have to be very careful that they are not done in a way that infringes on the freedom of expression or used to justify crackdowns on peaceful dissent and on civil society. Kenya, in the last election, established a commission that was specifically responsible for monitoring speech that could be incendiary and for issuing warnings, and they did so including after one rally where such speech was used and it led to the death of an individual. Countering hate speech I've already spoken to in regards to the tool that we have established uh, and that each of you can, can access online. In extreme cases, there are tools that are available, though rarely used, to jam the transmission of uh, certain types of dangerous speech and hate speech. Prosecutions have been used in certain countries as well to hold responsible those who, are, who have been using this type of speech. I think one thing that is really critical to keep in mind, and I, I mentioned at the outset, is there are cases where there is dangerous speech. There is dangerous speech that takes place in Canada, where I'm from. There's dangerous speech that takes place in many countries around the world that does not lead to the commission of mass atrocities, uh, which again underscores the need for there to be a strong respect for the rule of law, a strong respect for the promotion of diversity and tolerance. Unfortunately, in many of the countries that we are concerned about, that is not what prevails. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, we have been doing work on Burma, uh, and you can actually access our, our report uh, on Burma online, and we'll have another one forthcoming. Burma is one example where when we talk about the risk of genocide today, one of the early warning signs that we explicitly cite in our report is rampant and unchecked hate speech against the Rohingya and other Muslims. We go into greater detail in the report 
uh, documenting the fact that well-known and well-resourced Buddhist monks have used their influence to promulgate hateful rhetoric against Muslims, often referring to Rohingya and others as, Mus as foreigners, and that this hate speech is essentially going unchecked by the government. And though there are local civil society organizations that are trying to counter them, it is uh, woefully underfunded and under-supported. So this is an area that we continue to, as an institution, uh, focus on and are committed through the creation of this guide and through the, the work of the reports that we put out on countries of concern of highlighting the, the potential dangerous elements associated with hate speech. I'm really uh, very heartened to hear about the creation of the Plan of Action and that it will be introduced because for many of us, we've worked in countries where we have seen the remarkable power of uh, religious leaders joining together across different faiths to be messengers of hope, messengers of peace. And in countries like Guinea and Kenya, in some cases that has also played a very determining role in trying to ensure that atrocities are not committed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. And thank you all for giving us the opportunity to hear from you. And, and not just what the issues we're talking about, but also the recommendation and of course, we are looking forward to the plan of action. And I thank Congressman Jim Costa and Congressman Ed Royce for giving the opportunity, but also to take these recommendations to as many of the staff that are here today. And we will also work bringing this information to other members of Congress here to be on the recommendation that you've given. We apologize for running over time. I know you have a busy schedule. So we thank all the panelists and everybody here for coming to this briefing. Uh, one short point, there is a, a reception at uh, room 2261 at 530, so please all are welcome to come there. It is, uh, the reception is not on this body, but a body from uh, the Emergency Caucus Committee and the Emergency Congressional Caucus. So please join uh, that organization's briefing, uh, briefing, briefing here, but the reception there. And I thank you all for giving us the time to listen to you as well. Thank you very much. ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਅੱਜ ਇੱਥੇ ਕਾਂਗਰਸ ਦੀ ਰੇਵਰਨ ਬਿਲਡਿੰਗ ਚ ਇੱਕ ਬ੍ਰੀਫਿੰਗ ਹੋਈ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕਿ ਕਾਂਗਰਸਮੈਨ ਐਡਰੋਇਸ ਜਿਮ ਕੋਸਟਾ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਸਿੱਖ ਕਾਂਗਰੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਕਾਕਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਮਿਲ ਕੇ ਸੱਦੀ ਗਈ ਸੀ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅੰਡਰ ਸੈਕਟਰੀ ਜਨਰਲ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਚੀਮਾ ਅਤੇ ਹੋਲੋਕਾਸਟ 뮤ਜ਼ੀਅਮ ਤੋਂ ਇੱਕ ਡਿਪਟੀ ਡਾਇਰੈਕਟਰ ਵੀ ਵੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਭਾਗ ਲਿਆ ਸੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਅੱਜ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਧਾਰਮਿਕ ਨੇਤਾ ਨੇ ਜਾਂ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਆ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਵਧਾਉਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਜਾਂ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਰੋਕਦੇ ਨੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਖੁੱਲ ਕੇ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਵੀ ਹੋਈ ਹੈ ਔਰ ਉਹਦੇ ਬਚਾਉਣ ਦੇ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਬੰਦ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਤਰੀਕਿਆਂ ਤੇ ਵੀ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਹੋਈ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਟਾਫ ਨੇ ਸਟਾਫ ਨੇ ਕਾਂਗਰਸਮੈਨ ਦੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਾਫੀ ਵੱਡੀ ਗਿਣਤੀ ਚ ਭਾਗ ਲਿਆ ਤੇ ਇਹਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਮੈਂਟਸ ਨੇ ਰਿਪੋਰਟਸ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਦਿਨਾਂ ਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਕਾਂਗਰਸਮੈਨ ਨੂੰ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਜਾਣਗੇ ਤੇ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੀਆਂ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਮੀਟਿੰਗਸ ਨੇ ਬ੍ਰੀਫਿੰਗਸ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਅਤਵਾਦ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਧਾਰਮਿਕ ਲੋਕ ਫਲਾਉਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਰੋਕਣ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੀ ਹੁੰਦੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਅਸੀਂ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਸਟੇਟਸ ਦੀ ਕਾਂਗਰਸ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰਮੁੱਖ ਬਿਲਡਿੰਗ ਰੇਬਰਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਕਿ ਹੁਣੇ ਹੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਬ੍ਰੀਫਿੰਗ ਜਿਸ ਨੂੰ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਨੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੇ ਅੰਡਰ ਸੈਕਟਰੀ ਜਨਰਲ ਔਰ ਪ੍ਰੀਵੈਂਸ਼ਨ ਆਫ ਜੈਨੋਸਾਈਡ ਦੀ ਡਿਪਟੀ ਡਾਇਰੈਕਟਰ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕਿ ਹੋਲੋਕਾਸਟ 뮤ਜ਼ੀਅਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨੇ ਨੰਬਰ 2 ਪਰਸਨ ਔਰ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਆਈ ਕੇ ਚੀਮਾ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਿ ਇੰਗਲੈਂਡ ਤੋਂ ਇੱਕ ਸਕਾਲਰ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਜੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਨੂੰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਬ੍ਰੀਫਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਸੁਣਿਆ ਔਰ ਕਾਫੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਾਰਾ ਕਮਰਾ ਉਹ ਭਰਿਆ ਹੋਇਆ ਸੀ 25 ਤੋਂ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਕਾਂਗਰਸਮੈਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਟਾਫਰ ਔਰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕੰਸਰਨਡ ਲੋਕ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਆਏ ਹੋਏ ਸਨ ਸੋ ਜ਼ਾਹਰ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਬੇਸ਼ੱਕ ਇਸ ਦਾ ਵਿਸ਼ਾ ਸਾਡੇ ਸਾਊਥ ਏਸ਼ੀਆ ਦੇ ਇੱਕ ਕਿਸੇ ਖਾਸ ਟੌਪਿਕ ਨਾਲ ਸੰਬੰਧਿਤ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਕੁੱਲ ਮਿਲਾ ਕੇ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਧਰਮ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਮਜ਼ਹਬ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਮਜ਼ਹਬ ਦੇ ਲੀਡਰ ਕੀ ਰੋਲ ਅਦਾ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਨੇ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿਸੇ ਵੀ
ਸੋ ਕਿੰਨੋ ਹੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਜੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਨੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੇ ਅੰਡਰ ਸੈਕਟਰੀ ਜਨਰਲ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਜੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਬੜੀ ਬ੍ਰੋਡਰ ਕੰਟੈਕਸਟ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸੀ ਔਰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਖਾਇਸ਼ ਜ਼ਾਹਿਰ ਕੀਤੀ ਕਿ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਉਹ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ ਐਡਵਾਈਜ਼ਰ ਵੀ ਨੇ ਫਾਰ ਪ੍ਰੀਵੈਂਸ਼ਨ ਅਗੇਂਸਟ ਜੈਨੋਸਾਈਡ ਦੇ ਕਿ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਅਲੱਗ-ਅਲੱਗ ਧਰਮ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਲੋਕ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਲੀਡਰ ਇਹ ਰੋਲ ਅਦਾ ਕਰਨ ਕਿ ਨਫ਼ਰਤ ਦੀ ਥਾਂ ਤੇ ਪਿਆਰ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਏ ਔਰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਇਸਲਾਮ ਦੇ ਹਵਾਲੇ ਨਾਲ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਇਥੋਪੀਆ ਜਿਸ ਦਾ ਪਹਿਲਾ ਨਾਮ ਐਡਮਿਸੀਆ ਸੀ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਹਜ਼ਰਤ ਮੁਹੰਮਦ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਨੂੰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਫਾਲੋਅਰਸ ਨੂੰ ਪਨਾਹ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਗਈ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਕੋਟ ਕਰਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਔਰ ਬੜਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਅੱਛਾ ਫਰੇਜ਼ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਅੱਜ ਕਲੈਸ਼ ਆਫ ਸਿਵਲਾਈਜੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਕਲੈਸ਼ ਆਫ ਇਗਨੋਰੈਂਸਿਸ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਅਗਿਆਨਤਾ ਵਸ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਸਰੇ ਦੇ ਗਲ ਪੈਂਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਸਰੇ ਦਾ ਨੁਕਸਾਨ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਆਈ ਕੇ ਚੀਮਾ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਜੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਤਿੰਨ ਦੇਸ਼ ਐਜ਼ ਅ ਕੇਸ ਸਟੱਡੀ ਚੁਣੇ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਔਰ ਮਿਆਂਮਾਰ ਜਿਸ ਦਾ ਪੁਰਾਣਾ ਨਾਮ ਬਰਮਾ ਔਰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਬੜੀ ਡੀਟੇਲ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਕਿ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਮੁਲਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਧਰਮ ਵਾਲੇ ਲੀਡਰ ਵੀ ਔਰ ਸਿਸਟਮ ਵੀ ਉਹ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਕਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਉਸ ਨਫ਼ਰਤ ਦੀ ਹੇਟ ਸਪੀਚ ਨੂੰ ਫਿਰ ਉਸ ਦੇ ਐਕਸਪ੍ਰੈਸ਼ਨ ਨੂੰ ਅੱਗੇ ਤੋਰ ਕੇ ਔਰ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦੇ ਕੇਸ ਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਹਿੰਦੂਤਵਾਦ ਦੇ ਹਵਾਲੇ ਨਾਲ ਕਿ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਹੇਟ ਸਪੀਚ ਅੱਜ ਇਸ ਮੁਕਾਮ ਤੱਕ ਪਹੁੰਚੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦਾ ਹਿਸਟੋਰੀਕਲ ਗੁਰਦੁਆਰਾ ਗਿਆਨ ਗੋਦੜੀ ਹਰਦਵਾਰ ਤੋਂ ਗਾਇਬ ਕਰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਔਰ ਇਸੇ ਕੰਟੈਕਸਟ ਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਗ੍ਰੰਥ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਦੀ ਬੇਅਦਬੀ ਦੀਆਂ ਘਟਨਾਵਾਂ ਦਾ ਜ਼ਿਕਰ ਕੀਤਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਮੁਸਲਮਾਨਾਂ ਈਸਾਈਆਂ ਬੌਧੀਆਂ ਦਲਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਹਿੰਦੂ ਤੋਂ ਵੀ ਵਿਚਾਰਧਾਰਾ ਦੇ ਥੱਲੇ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕਿ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਹਿੰਦੂ ਹਿੰਦੀ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਸ ਨਾਰੇ ਯਕੀਨ ਰੱਖਦੀ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਦਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਜ਼ਿਕਰ ਕੀਤਾ ਔਰ ਹੋਲੋਕਾਸਟ 뮤ਜ਼ੀਅਮ ਤੋਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਡਿਪਟੀ ਡਾਇਰੈਕਟਰ ਪ੍ਰੀਵੈਂਸ਼ਨ ਅਗੇਂਸਟ ਜੈਨੋਸਾਈਡ ਦੇ ਐਡਵਾਈਜ਼ਰੀ ਰੋਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਆਪਣਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਰੀਅਰ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਰਵਾਂਡਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਹੁਤਸੀ ਤੁਤਸੀ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਬਸ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਇੱਕ ਮਾਈਨੋਰਿਟੀ ਸੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਪਰਸੀਕਿਊਸ਼ਨ ਹੋਈ ਪਰ ਜਦੋਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਹੱਥ ਪਾਵਰ ਆਈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕੀ ਕੀਤਾ ਔਰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਇਸ ਕੰਟੈਕਸਟ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੀ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਨੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਰეკਮੈਂਡੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਪ੍ਰੀਵੈਂਸ਼ਨ ਅਗੇਂਸਟ ਜੈਨੋਸਾਈਡ ਲਈ ਦਿੱਤੀਆਂ ਜਾ ਰਹੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਅੱਜ ਦੀ ਬ੍ਰੀਫਿੰਗ ਸੀ ਇਹ ਕੋਈ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਇੱਕ ਪੁਆਇੰਟ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਪਰ ਮੈਂ ਸਮਝਦਾ ਹਾਂ ਵੀ ਇਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਜ 7 ਜੂਨ ਨੂੰ ਇਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਾਰਟਿਸਿਪੇਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਸਿੱਖ ਪਾਵਰ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਵੀ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਫਰੈਂਡਸ ਆਫ ਸਿੱਖ ਕਾਕਸ ਜਿਨੇ ਹੁਣੇ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਰਿਸੈਪਸ਼ਨ ਵੀ ਰੱਖੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਇਨਸਟਰੂਮੈਂਟਲ ਵੀ ਸਨ ਇਸ ਬ੍ਰੀਫਿੰਗ ਨੂੰ ਕਰਵਾਉਣ ਚ ਵੀ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਕੁੱਲ ਮਿਲਾ ਕੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਗਲੋਬਲ ਕੰਟੈਕਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜੈਨੋਸਾਈਡ ਰੋਕਣ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਏਗੀ ਉਦੋਂ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਮੁਸਲਮਾਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਈਸਾਈਆਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਦਲਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਔਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਬਲ ਨੇ ਮੂਲ ਨਿਵਾਸੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਕੀ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਇਸ਼ੂਜ਼ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਵੀ ਫੋਕਸ ਹੋਏਗਾ ਸੋ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਸਮਝਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਐਫਰਟ